Hello and welcome to Around the Verse, our weekly look at the development of Star Citizen. I'm Sandy Gardner. And since Chris Roberts is busy at our Manchester office, I'm joined by lead technical designer Kirk Tomei. Thanks for being with us here today, Kirk. It's awesome to be here, Sandy. Our community team is at it again, following up their appearance last week at PAX East with a visit to South by Southwest this week. And this Saturday, the Austin studio will be hosting a panel as part of the festival. The team will share details about the Evocati testing group, the importance of the Issue Council, and more. So if you're attending South by Southwest, you should definitely stop by. Later in the show, the design team will reveal what goes into the modular designs for levels and layouts in Star Citizen. But first, let's head out to Erin Roberts in the UK for our studio update. So let's take a look. Hi everyone, I'm Erin Roberts. I head up global production at Cloud Improving Games and I manage our European studios. I'm based here in our Foundry 42 Wimslow office, which is about 10 miles south of Manchester in the northwest of England. We are now at 201 people in this office and we have a further nine employees at our new small Derby studio in the East Midlands, which focuses on mainly facial animations, but also some body animation for Squadron 42 and Star Citizen. Already this year, we've hired 22 new staff and for a bit of fun, we worked out the combined games development experience of everyone in Foundry 42 UK, which comes to 1,510 years. We've just finished work on the expansion of the first floor of Freedom House in Wimslow, which has given us back some badly needed space as everyone was crammed into, onto just two floors for the last three months and it, it wasn't great. The new floor is definitely a breath of fresh air and has given us 76 new desk spaces, two conference rooms named Retribution and Gladius, and a great new break area called Fortune's Cross. Some of these names you know, others you'll be introduced to as Star Citizen grows. We've got a pretty big update for you guys, so let's get into some of the details about what we've been up to this last month. On the programming side, we've been working on a number of systems to really push the quality and immersion of both Squadron 42 and the Persistent Universe. We've completed Sprint 2 of the player interaction system, which improves how the player interacts with items or picks up objects using the new highlighting and inner fort systems. This will allow a much more intuitive and accessible UI experience for players, clearly identifying what they can interact with, as well as a clean, smooth experience while doing so. The new system, or the new mission system, that is, is moving really well. We are now on Sprint Free and Design are using the new tools to set up the missions in the PU. The old flow graph missions, which were not scalable to the need of our dynamic universe, are going away to be replaced with a tool which can create diverse and systemic missions, giving the player an abundance of different and diverse mission types. Also tied to this, the design team here is now also using the new Frankfurt developed system editor tool known as Solid to visually put together our system maps for Star Citizen. Both of these tools will really increase the productivity of our design teams. We've completed two locomotion sprints, the first to blend the walk into full run and back to walk animation sets to create a much more realistic feeling for player inertia whilst using the keyboard. The second sprint was to vastly improve AI path following so characters traverse close spaces and blend between animations in a much smoother manner. Our graphics team has been busily working on proving and optimizing the lighting in the game. One major part of this work is a major upgrade to the quality and accuracy of rectangular lights, which is a feature the artists have been requesting due to the prevalence of these types of lights in science fiction films. Typically, game support to the rectangular lights is very limited due to their very high cost, which is why we've spent a lot of time optimizing our shaders to make them viable. The diffuse lighting and the reflections are now much closer to real world behavior, and the difference this makes to our character lighting is absolutely huge. On the networking side, the team is finishing off the serialized variable which will reduce network, ban network bandwidth for the PU. They finished the new message queue to make the sending and receiving of packets more stable and are finishing off the new multiplayer mega map so players can quickly traverse to different game modes without the long load times of the past. Animation has been very busy also. Weapon reload, firing, hand posing, select, and deselect work has been worked on for the P4AR, P8SC, P8AR, Devastator Shotgun, Railgun, Gallant, and Arrowhead. Previous work has been done for the oxygen and stamina sprints, as well as feedback on the female rig, so we can lock down final posing. Other work includes a no weapon locomotion pass update, stock sprint update, and the prone combat animation pass. Our facial animators in our Derby studio have been focusing on a lot of S42 work to bring our characters and story to life, 
as well as work on the PU for 3.0 to support fixers, bartenders, shopkeepers and general population wild lines. The concept team's work is ongoing on the Aegis Reclaimer interiors. The team has worked on a second pass on weapons to improve reload visuals and add detail where needed, and work has been ongoing on new ship weapons also. There has also been a lot of concept work for both our PU and Squadron 42 environments to give our artists strong direction on our planetary landscapes, habitations and landing locations, but also for our space environments and space stations, and it is looking really cool. Moving on to the environment team, has lots of ongoing work with Squadron 42, but has also started early work on the truck stop exteriors, including the interior modularity, to show the variety of locations we will be able to place in the PU. The team has been working to keep the art style consistent, while also accommodating all the functionality required by design. The planetary service outposts are just finishing their initial art sprint, and the base building set is complete. The team have all the elements needed to create small outposts in multiple configurations which are being set up so that they can be distributed across different landscapes. Now we have our building blocks, we can start adding the details which give them flavour and detail. Also, with the surface outpost, the team is developing how our shaders are going to react when we place these architectural elements in various biomes. We are looking into a system which will help give us believable systemic integration without having to invest lots of bespoke art time. Lastly, the environment team has been investing time in creating the visual targets for our space look and feel. Not only do we want to add lots of detail to our locations, moons and planets, but also we want space itself to be exciting and interesting to explore, whether travelling through anything from a nebula or dense asteroid field to a space storm or an anomaly. The visual effects team has been focusing on a lot of planning to support our new planetary environments, including atmospheric flight effects and modular procedurally generated surface spaces. Work has been done on thruster and damage effects for the Constellation Achilla, high tech damage effects library updates, building on last month's explosion template and also further polish to ballistic SMG weapons. The UI team has been working incredibly hard over the last months putting together what you guys have already seen with the new front-end interfaces from 2.6 and are still strongly plowing ahead with the needs of both the PU and S42. This month's work has progressed on our new kiosk shopping interface, proven out by our prototype which allows us to make sure it works in all our locations and shop types. Also, work is continuing on improving all our in-game HUD UI, whether walking around or on a ship. The audio team, as always, are supporting all the sprints and tie into and support most of the work the other teams do. This month, the standout tasks included fixing up performance issues and tool improvements, audio for new ships including the Dragonfly, Connie Aquila, Prospectrum and Buccaneer, work on the music composition for both at Squadron 42 and the PU, speech processing, fixes to weapon audio, and finally Foley work so the right noises can be heard from differing material types. Anyway, that's it from the UK office this month. I hope you all enjoyed the update and it gave you some insight into how much is going on, not only in this office, but all throughout CIG, as a lot of these features we talk about are a collaboration between teams spanning sometimes all five of our studios. Hopefully you get an interesting glimpse of why the team is working so hard to create a universe and level of immersion never seen in a computer game before. This is truly why Star Citizen will be the best damn space sim ever. Once again, I'd like to thank all our subscribers for helping us put together these updates together and of course, everyone in the community for your incredible support. You are all powering us on to make this groundbreaking universe and dream come alive. It's really appreciated by everyone here at Cloud Imperium Games. Thank you all, and I'll see you in the verse.
Thanks, Aaron. It's wonderful to see all the ways the Manchester office works with other studios to improve the persistent universe. Yeah, I can't wait to experience all the different missions and locations that will be available as the PU grows. While we're on the topic of expanding PU, designing levels and layouts for Star Citizen is unlike level designing for any other game. While most games only want to take the players from point A to point B, Star Citizen needs to feel like a livable place, so traditional game design techniques don't always work. Which is why we sat down with the game director, Todd Pappy, and lead level designer, Andreas Johansson. Up next, they'll share how their level design process is unique to Star Citizen. So today we kind of want to talk about our level design process and, and um, in particular towards the Persistent Universe and, and how that differs from what we consider traditional level, level design processes. Both of us can come from a very traditional level design process, which is you're building everything very bespoke. Um, you start with where, where the level, um, uh, what the level goal is, where it starts, where it ends, um, and then everything um, getting from the start to end is tailor-made, and the path is, is, is completely chosen um, and um, tweaked and tuned by the designer as well as the artists um, until uh, the product ships. With uh, all of the challenges that we need to build and um, solar systems that we need to build in S42 or in S42 as well as Persistent Universe, um, we couldn't use our traditional um, experience um, from there. So we started talking about a, a modular system, and um, what that will allow us to do is uh, basically build archetypes of of things, and then from there. Um, go through and start switching out to different modular pieces. Um, so why don't you kind of run us through like a yeah, truck I mean, stop or... Our greatest challenge is like how do we populate the universe that is the size of our game with enough content to make it feel mm -hmm. alive, right? Um, we have 100 solar systems in the game. We might have 50, we might have 100 space stations. Even if we have 100 space stations, we're looking at 10,000 locations which we have to build. And with the small team we have, four level designers, it would take us about 650 years to build that the traditional way, which was... It's totally know. achievable in our lifetime. I, I mean, it's I a long-term job security, it, right? Exactly. So, <laughs> so, I mean, the only way we can really do that is, is like Todd said, it's like with a modular system. Um, we do build our locations with a tile set, which is small pieces of walls and corners and doors that we put together into rooms. But this is still not fast enough. We have to find a quicker way to do this. So the way we can approach this is to looking into grouping these smaller tile sets into bigger, bigger entities, rooms. We have kitchens, we have toilets, we have locker rooms, we have lobbies, we have everything that you can imagine that you need on a space station to... To make it feel believable. Yeah, and, exactly, and... exactly. So instead of, instead of building every, every location unique, we build these rooms, we populate a big library of assets, and then we use these assets, assets to put together the station itself in a much quicker way. Correct, but even then when we're talking about like a base level of an archetype or something like that, we're mm -hmm. talking about a very neutral um, feel and look to, to that so that when we start adding these modular pieces um, in a, a hub section or something like that, so mm -hmm. that you, you don't really notice, you know, it, like if, if those base assets are in, in that neutral set, then you really start noticing the repetition and, and, yep. and everything. So, I mean, we, when we build things, we build everything using a template tile set, which is a complete, as, as tile set, like a neutral, neutral, it has no textures and nothing special on it. And then um, we build out the basic shapes and we, we define the purpose of the room. And then we can convert that into many different types of, of, um, of themes, um, low tech, high tech, all the things we have. Mm -hmm. But um, we also have another level on top of that, which is the content of the room itself. So. When you do a game that is an MMO, almost all MMOs use some kind of modular system or some kind of tile set to build their locations. You will always see repetition at some point. You will go into a location and say, well, you know, I've been in this room before and we want to get away from this. So we've gone through many iterations of the modular system and we tried to figure out how can we alleviate this in the best way possible? How can we make sure that even if it, it is the fifth time you go through this very room, it still feels different. And we have a couple of different ways of doing that. Yeah. Like Andrea said, we have the the tile sets. So uh, what we would consider low tech, um, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, um, as well as high tech. And then we have super modernism and a few other um, tile sets that will still need to be built. And 
and um, worked on. Then from there, we have wear and tear associated with that. So there's dirt passes, you know, how pristine is this, um, is this truck stop? Is, is it in the middle of um, Crusader? So therefore there's a lot of money that's around that one. So th that one will be in very pristine condition um, versus something that is out in the middle of nowhere and it's super run down and it feels more like a mom and pop or Route 66 um, kind of truck stop or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Then um, from there, we've got like what he was talking about with the, uh, with the actual props that go inside there. And then we also have the different levels of power um, piping that, that can go in there. And so we can make it feel more like a derelict or it's, uh, it's up and running and, and uh, it's got a certain amount of hustle and bustle associated with it based off of the AI or, or, or what is happening in the solar system at that time. Yeah, so if you go back to, for example, the props that Todd mentioned, that is something that is it's a very useful tool for us to change up the feeling of a location. So the way we're kind of moving right now is that we, we won't actually create, let's say, a bathroom and fill it with all the props that it needs. What we'll do is we'll create the shape of a bathroom and we'll fill it with area shapes and volumes which can spawn in assets in different constellations. And that means that you might go into exactly the same bathroom in one station and um, it looks one way. You do go into the same bathroom in another station and there's a different amount of toilets, there's a different amount of sinks, uh, there's, the mirrors are in a different place, so it looks different. So by using these kind of systems, we can um, get a great amount of variation from our, from our smaller component of rooms and make the stations mm -hmm. feel unique and different, even though you're actually playing through the, a similar, uh, similar room as you've seen before. In the process, in us building this, I, I, I think we really started on this maybe I want to say about a year and a half ago, um, and at that point it was just um, Andreas and, and another level designer that was really focused on, on this, um, and now, uh, now we have the other resources really coming in, meaning art is coming in and, and working on how do we uh, do this from an internal perspective but also from an external perspective on the space stations and, and how do we make these things um, have unique silhouettes associated with them so that when you're coming up to it you you, you get a very clear read of what you're coming to the size of it um, and uh, you know what is it meant to be is it meant to be a, a very large space station or is it meant to be a, a, a small little space station out in the middle of nowhere um, and then from there we also have a, a, a tech artist slash coder that is, is working with us to build our modular system so that this will allow us to run um, this, uh, this, this tool which will allow us to take these different shapes and combine them together with, with unique points of interest um, in those and then basically kind of randomize it, run through it, play it, see what it feels like randomize it again and then this will allow us to generate the stations that as as quick as we possibly can because we do have a lot of content that we need to fill it's just building up these tools and building up these um these rooms and and uh, the pipeline you know to actually flip the switch and and really pump these things out yeah so i mean one one of the processes we're looking into is we won't actually build we won't have a level designer sitting and dragging rooms in a construction of a space station. That's not how we're going to build it. Because we have the libraries of all the rooms that we can use in a space station. We have all the, the procedural generation of the props that exist in the rooms. The way we're going to build it is that we're going to create a basic flow chart of a station, which indicates where rooms are supposed to be. You start with a hub, that you come from an elevator, you go into a hub. You might move into another corridor that has like a locker room or has um, a diner attached to it. And we build this flow in, uh, in, in a scripting tool. And then from that flow, we can generate a seed. And we generate a location. Basically, the, the editor will generate a location based on that flow. So taking the seed, we can generate many, many different space stations with the same flow that will look completely different because it gets different types of bathrooms. We specify it needs a bathroom. So in one location, it has a small one. Another one has a medium one. Um, different, the, different stores. Different stores. It has different props in the rooms when you go in, into the location. So a space station will always look the same, but you can have another space station based on the same seed that looks completely different. So it might have the same hub, but they actually feel different because they have different props and they have a different layout of, 
of doors and connectors. So with that, a level designer could technically throw out 20, 30 space stations in a day. But of course, we have to go in yes. and double check all that information. We can't just generate ship to, to the persistent universe and it's like job's done. You know, that doesn't work like that. We have to go in and verify the, the layout. So even though we can generate a large amount of seeds and a large amount of different stations, we still have to do the proper work. We have to go through, check the consistency of everything, see that it works, see that we don't walk into a room and it's a door into space and everyone has a very bad day. You know, that would be pretty terrible. Uh, we don't know exactly how this will play out. I mean, we have our ideas and I think once we're fully through the R&D phase and and it can actually generate you know, 15, 20 different truck stops. We start mm -hmm. seeing where the repetition happens and, and then at that point it will be trying to work out how can we cut down that repetition. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is, is since we'll have so many different archetypes, we'll be, you know, ideally the player's not running into this area over and over and over again. You know, we're still very early in the process. We're yeah. we're in white box phase, and and this is really the artists have has started to come in now, and are breaking down these tile sets um, you know, for uh, the satellites, for the the planetary outposts, as well as for the truck stop. Um, those are kind of the the three main ones that we're focusing on right now, and each one of them, you know, require kind of their own unique. Uh, thought process on, on kind of the modularity and how those things work. Um, the overall idea is still the same, it's just how do those things connect together is, is very different. Mm -hmm. I just want to iterate, we're not planning on shipping 50 space stations per day, that's not yeah. what I'm yeah. it's, it's the possibility yeah. of generating the layouts. The actual yes. stations will take a l quite a bit longer yeah. because you still have to make sure that everything exists and everything works. So With this modular system, um, this is really to build out what we would consider our um, our lower or even mid-tier space stations. We will still have very bespoke um, layouts. So for example, if you think about Grim Hex or you think about um, Hurston or Area 18, these are very bespoke layouts that um, we go through and, and do handcraft. Um, in the future, we would, I think all of us would like to see if this system would work in, in actually building a city and, and um, doing it procedurally. Uh, but this is really to build up the other 95% of the contents that is in the universe besides um, just these, these big bespoke landing areas. The way work has evolved uh, over time from being mm, not only level designers but more s kind of spatial architects where when in a traditional game, when you build a level, you have to think about the gameplay, you have to think about covers and flow and where the enemy is going to spawn and all these kind of things. And this is not really what we're doing when we're building our locations because we want this to feel real, we want it to feel believable. It should be a place where people live and work for months at a time. So when we build these locations, we have to think about how does rooms connect together? What is the flow? How would people actually build this? Um, it's much more thinking about the space as, as kind of a, a living area for people instead of a gameplay space. And that is why the role of the designer, especially the level designer in this, has kind of evolved into being a little bit more uh, than just kind of gameplay oriented. It's less about path from point, interest, point of interest to point of interest to point of interest. This is, this is, and it's more about making sure that these areas feel absolutely believable. Mm -hmm. And um, that you know you understand that there, there was a thought process behind creating this. Also, being a space game, it gives us a little bit extra because if we would go to space in the future as the human race, we would build things modular, modularly. Can't even say that word, <laughs> even though I work with it a lot. Um, so it is not that that strange of a, an, an approach to take. You know, you would you would need things to function between different stations for repairs and for expansion of other things. So you might end up going to a location in space and it's a pirate base, but you can clearly see that this at some point was an old mining outpost that after the ore ran out, it got transitioned over to a nightclub for mercenaries and then it got taken over by pirates and now you have this. Which is basically what Grim Hex is. Pretty much, yeah. you know, it's all party there. Yeah. This is actually where we're at in the level design process, and mm -hmm. I know it's it's taken us a long time to get to this point. But there's a 
a lot of um, research and development that have gone into um, the, the process and, and how um, these areas are constructed and, and it definitely hasn't been a, a simple task. Measure twice, cut once, right? Exactly. I appreciate the amount of detail they put into designing each truck stop and space station, especially with the assistance of the modular system. I agree, and it's really going to help the PU feel authentic. And that's it for this episode of ATV. But before we go, we'd like to thank all of our subscribers whose contributions allow us to make shows like this, Citizen of the Stars, Bug Smashers, and Lore Makers. If you're not a subscriber and are interested in learning more, click on the link in the description below. Of course, Star Citizen wouldn't exist without our backers. So big thank you for everything. We wouldn't be here without you. No, we wouldn't. And please join us tomorrow at 12 Pacific for Star Citizen Happy Hour. Jared Huckabee, Tyler Whitkin, and community streamer Grit Spitter will be playing Star Marine with fans in Alpha 2.6.1. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you Around, around the, the Verse. verse. Oh wait, didn't I mention the UK makes ships too. Hope you enjoy.
you for watching. So if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.